Satan's impact on God's revelation. First of all, we must ask the question, what is sin? To this we should answer, sin is a comprehensive rebellion of a personal creature against his creator. Now let's take a look at who can sin. Things cannot sin. Only created beings can. That is to say, angels, human persons, and then there's the interesting question as to whether human institutions can sin. Can a government sin? Or can a state sin? I think our conclusion here must be only persons can sin. But this does not mean that only men can sin, for fallen angels too have sinned and do sin. Nor does this mean that man can only sin as an individual. For scripture also mentions that families sin and nations too can believe and sin. Sin is a reproach for any people. Uh, none persons, however, cannot sin. Animals, plants, and lifeless things such as rocks cannot themselves sin, although all of these do indeed suffer as a result of the sins of persons. Next we should ask, when can one sin? Well, first of all, as regards the angels, the elect angels could only sin before the fall of the angels. The reprobate angels could only sin at and after their fall, and they shall continue to sin everlastingly. As far as men are concerned, all men could not sin before the human fall, because man was made upright. Elect men cannot sin according to their new nature from the time of their regeneration onward, and they will not be able to sin at all after their deaths. Reprobate men could not sin before the fall, but since then they cannot stop sinning, and they shall continue to sin everlastingly. Next, let us understand the impact of sin. Sin destroyed one-third of the angels. It destroyed an unknown percentage of mankind. It destroys man's environment. It destroys the non-human environment to some extent, such as the ground, the plants, the animals. Uh, Calvin even felt that outer space and the distant stars had been cursed by God as a result of man's sin. Notice that sin can only destroy, that is to twist or to pervert. It cannot annihilate or to abolish into nothingness. Sin can only misdirect the whole of life away from God and towards Satan. What is the impact on God's revelation of sin? Well, fallen man forgets God's direct audible revelation. Although God does redisclose some of this revelation, and he expands it in new special revelation, and then he permanently and inerasably deposits it in the Bible. Fallen man misrepresents indirect nature revelation because God's curse now rests on nature although man may understand it sufficiently for his present life by interpreting it through the spectacles of Holy Scripture. Now let's take a look at sin and the fall of Satan. First of all we need to see that Lucifer was created by God and therefore he was created very good. One third of heaven and of its inhabitants uh, used to be very good before they became bad. The word Lucifer, derived from two Latin words, lux, or light, and ferro, I bear, the word means the bearer of the light. In other words, Satan, or before he was Satan, when he was Lucifer, bore the light. That is, he upheld and exalted God the Son. Lucifer's first condition then was one of 
gloriousness, yet he was fallible and did indeed fall. When we look at the fall of Lucifer into sin, we see that he fell through pride. This may have been through dissatisfaction with his createdness or dissatisfaction with his dependency on Almighty God. He fell through jealousy. Uh, John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, believed that Lucifer fell after the creation of man when Lucifer, the pinnacle of God's creation until man was created, became insanely jealous of Adam and promptly himself apostatized from the Lord. As regards the scope of the fall of the angels, we see that fully one-third of all of the angels irretrievably fell into sin. It was a spiritual fall. Uh, it was not a physical fall from heaven onto the earth, although the Mohammedans, but not Christians, believe that it was. Uh, the results of the fall of the angels uh, were the following. First of all, Lucifer now became Satan, and the fallen angels became demons. Yet they are still God's creatures, albeit his unholy creatures. Third, they were all ejected from heaven. Fourth, they would seem to have inhabited the earth at least up to the time that man was created and possibly up to the time that Christ triumphed on Calvary. Fifth, there is some evidence that they may have inhabited the earth for a while uh, until the fall of man and that this may explain a previous destruction of the earth uh, which may or may not have led to the fossilization of certain prehistoric animals at that time um, prior to the advent of man. Sixth, Satan once on earth invaded the Garden of Eden. It's interesting to see that God gave Adam a number of jobs and that one of the jobs was to guard the garden, that is, to keep the satanic trespasser out of God's private property. Seventh, Satan in fact caused the human fall, but in such a way that man himself as a free agent was fully responsible for himself sinning. Eighth, God cursed the entire cosmos, including Satan, driving Satan into hell. Ninth, God progressively destroys Satan, first of all by casting him out of heaven, second by expelling him from Eden, third by casting him out of the world as such at Calvary, fourth time and again God defeats Satan through his church, down through church history, and this defeat will continue in future centuries. And uh, finally, there is the final destruction of Satan and all of his followers by God when they shall be cast with hell into the lake of fire and ultimately there shall be God's final restoration of the entire universe except of course for hell and the lake of fire which shall continue forever. Now let's take a look at sin and the fall of man. First of all, we need to understand the relationship between Lucifer's sin and man's sin. Well, originally, there was a free agency, both of Lucifer and of Adam, which was given them by God himself. Then, we need to see that Satan tempted Eve but that uh, at the moment both Satan and unregenerate man are depraved agents. Second, we need to examine whether man had any free choice or not in the very first sin that he committed. Now the Bible relates that, God, that Adam was created upright. He was not created neutral with two equal tendencies, one toward good and one toward evil. Adam had no evil tendencies at all. And yet, the very freedom of Adam's agency required 
him to be fallible. He had to be created fallible, that is to say, uh, with a possibility of being able to fall, otherwise it's difficult to see how he would have been free. Um, the angels, of course, were also created with fallible yet free perfect agency. God, however, is necessarily good. He is totally infallible. He is by definition righteous. When Adam and, in, when Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned freely and not because they were forced to sin. And yet, man's original sin, in a way that we cannot understand, was divinely predestinated on the basis, however, of man's own personal responsibility. Now, as to the scope of man's sin, we see that all men are now totally depraved. That is to say, sin affects every man and every part of every man. But total depravity does not mean that sin uh, affects every man equally. Not all men are murderers, not all men are adulterers, but all men are perverted in every part of their being. Second, sin disorients the entire cosmos, of which man is the crown. When man fell, the universe of which man was head fell with him fell away from God. This, of course, is an ethical fall, not a metaphysical fall. That is to say, the universe is not geographically further away from God now than it used to be, but it's twisted and misdirected as to, as to its function. Man, the earth, the sky, sea, all of their contents are all now directed away from God. Then sin disrupted God's original revelation to man. And finally, sin darkened man's understanding, thus stupefying man uh, to become unaware of the reality of God's revelation. Next, we should pay attention to God's gracious limitations of man's sin. Now, there are only three creatures in the universe that were never stained by sin. First of all, the unfallen angels were never stained by sin. Second, the created human nature of Christ was never stained by sin. And third, the created original writings of the Bible in the original Greek and Hebrew were not stained by sin. That is to say, the paper might have been and so too the ink, but not the message. Uh, fifth, we need to understand the key to all knowledge in a now sinful world. God, often by way of the ministry of his unfallen angels, communicates his will to his human elect. Then God's Son, the man Christ Jesus, saves the elect. And God's Word, the Spirit-breathed Bible, leads us to Christ and gives us the only correct perspective in a sinful world. N now note, by the word Jesus, we mean the Messianic Son of Man. We do not mean, by Jesus, the eternal Son of God. True as it is that Jesus was God, on account of the hypostatic union between his divine and his human natures, according to scripture there was no Jesus prior to his conception. Prior to Bethlehem, there was only the eternal Son of God who imparted his own divine personality to the impersonal and creaturely humanity of the Redeemer from the time of his creation onward. Now let's look at the nature of sin. <clears throat> First of all, we've already dealt with the definition of sin and seen its impact on both angels and man. Next, we need to look at the differences between the sin of the angels that fell and the sin of human beings 
Well, as regards original sin, the angels sinned spiritually. That is to say, none bodily, for the simple reason that the angels have no body. Man, however, sinned spiritually and bodily. The angels sinned individually, one at a time. But man sinned federally. That is to say, when Adam, the federal government of the whole of humanity, sinned, the whole of humanity that would descend from him were regarded by God as already sinful. So much as regards original sin. When we look at the present sin of angels and men, we see the following. It's difficult to determine whether fallen angels are wholly sinful or not. That is to say, are wicked angels right now as sinful as they could possibly become? Or are they still in the, prog in the process of becoming ever more sinful? Fallen man, however, is only partially sinful. God is still restraining wicked fallen man and preventing him from committing all the sins that he could possibly commit. And of course, gradually, God's hand of restraint is removed from unregenerate man until after the final judgment in hell, people will only sin continually the whole time. As regards future sin, this will depend on our eschatological position as to whether we expect an increase or a decrease of sin, either amongst the angels or amongst human beings. They will, however, both continue to sin, at least down to the final judgment. I personally believe that those who end up in hell will continue sinning in hell unto all eternity. Now, what about the characteristics of all sin? Now, all sin, no matter how slight it is, is damning. That is to say, requires the judgment of God on it. Second, all sin is an act of rebellion against God. All sin involves a misuse of tools or parts of our body or of our spirit which God has given us. Fourth, all sin involves a misdirection of man or an angel away from its originally intended purpose. All sin involves corruption of something essentially good. All sin is dynamic and spreads if it is not checked. And all sin is deprivational. That is to say, it deprives us of the opposite positive good virtue. Aspects of sin are that it involves missing the mark, turning away from that which is good, distorting, twisting, being unrighteous, lawless, anarchic, or rebelling against authority, nothing like vanity, evil, destruction, rebellion, transgression, putting yourself in debt to God, um, having an accident or a catastrophe, becoming guilty before God, being treasonous against him, being false, foolish, disobedient, apostate, inattentive, or flippant. There are various ways in which we can classify sin. Now this is applicable both to the sin of angels and to the sin of man. We may distinguish first of all initial sin, that is to say the first sin of the angels, which caused them to fall, or the first sin of man in the Garden of Eden. Second, there is inherited sin, sin which we inherit from our forefathers. Uh, of course, this doesn't apply to the angels, but it does apply to man. Now, under inherited sin, we have inherited guilt and inherited corruption. Inherited guilt means that uh, when Adam sinned, we all became guilty in him. Inherited corruption is what even born-again Christians retain after they are saved and until they die, even after their guilt has been forgiven them. That's why Christians continue to sin, because some corruption 
remains within them although I do believe that if we're properly yielded to the Holy Spirit the, the quality and the quantity of that corruption should be progressively diminished after we've become children of God then fourth there is actual sin that is when we consciously rebel against God and then there is fifth specific sin now under specific sins we can distinguish sins from one another as to their cardinality that is to say whether they involve pride greed intemperance immorality or whatever second as to the sociality of the sin is it a sin of thought word or deed obviously a sin of thought doesn't involve society only you know that you commit that sin a sin of word will involve you and at least one other person who's listening to you whom you pollute sin of deed may involve a great number of people we can all also distinguish sins as to their directivity in other words is the sin committed directly against God such as the sins of apostasy idolatry blasphemy and Sabbath desecration or is the sin committed indirectly against God such as sins directly against man revolution murder and adultery all sins are ultimately directed against God because when you hurt man he is the image of God and so by hurting your fellow man you insult the maker of man whose image uh, you, you insult the maker of man uh, who is God's image uh, so too sins of theft dishonesty and covetousness uh, are sins committed directly against God's image and therefore indirectly against God himself then we can further distinguish sins as to their positivity is it a sin of commission did I actively do something or is it a sin of omission did I omit to take a stand did I neglect to stand up for the Lord when someone else did something wrong because I was too chicken to take a stand uh, we can also distinguish sins uh, as to the differences between the shouts and the shout nots it's interesting that eight of the ten commandments are thou shalt nots two of them are shouts that is to say keep the Sabbath holy and honor thy father and thy mother we can also distinguish sin as to the severity involved uh, what is the status of the offender obviously the sin committed by a preacher uh, has much greater implications than the sin committed by a savage and we need to pay attention too to the status of the of the offended one uh, a sin directly against God is the worst kind of sin uh, sin against parents is bad sin against stronger brethren is not as bad as sin against little children that can more easily stumble we can also distinguish between uh, sins on account of their severity this will depend on the quality of the offense is it a sin directly and specifically against one of the Ten Commandments uh, or is it uh, a transgression of, of a municipal bylaw like running a red light when you're in a hurry which is also a sin but obviously less directly so than a breach of the one of the commandments is the sin repeated or committed but once and then also the circumstances of the offense was the sin committed on the Sabbath was it committed in public was it done in an emergency or whatever however no matter how many different ways we may categorize sin we need to see that every sin damns the sinner every sin even the least being against the sovereignty goodness and holiness of God and against his righteous law deserveth his wrath and curse both in this life and in the life which is to come and this sin whatever it is cannot be expiated but by the blood of Jesus Christ
Now let's take a look at the results of sin. As to persons affected, we must say that one-third of the angels have been affected by sin and 100% of mankind, some men permanently affected, others temporally affected, but all men affected until the time of their first death. As to the extent of personal sinfulness, we must point out that fallen angels and all men are totally depraved. That is, every part of their being is tainted with sin. Second, all angels, fallen angels, and all men are totally unable to obey God. It's a total inability of fallen beings to render to God what God justly continues to demand of them. Then we need to see that there is a partial restoration of regenerated fallen men. There is a complete restoration of saved fallen men in the hereafter, spiritually at death and bodily too at the end of history when they get their new body. But there is a total irrestorability of fallen angels and of reprobate men. What about the personal results of sinfulness? Well, some of the results of our sinfulness are shame, guilt, corruption, shortcomings such as insanity, infirmity, forgetfulness, errors, illusions, depravity, suffering, death, and ultimately the second death. We should note that um, the results of the above greatly impede man's ability to understand all of God's revelations, such as infirmity, insanity, and forgetfulness. What about the cosmic results of sinfulness? First of all, there's the cosmic curse. Very difficult to say whether the Bible teaches that man is cursed. I'm not aware of any place in Scripture which clearly teaches that God cursed man as such. Satan, however, was cursed. The plants have been cursed. We're not told that the animals were definitely cursed, though probably this would be a correct deduction from uh, the statement in uh, Romans 8 that the entire creation is in bondage on account of man's sin up to now, and it would seem that the world, our earth, is indeed cursed. Consider the abnormalities in our cosmos which have resulted since the advent of sin. Things such as deserts, floods, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, wars, rumors of wars, cyclones, hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, sunspots, tidal waves, droughts, desolations, enmity, freaks, deformities, poisons, hatred, violence, friction, uh, traffic accidents and all other kinds of disharmonies. Consider how sin has obscured God's revelation. First, sin has obscured God's revelation uh, to the fallen angels. Even though there is no obscuring of God's revelation to the unfallen angels. Then again, uh, God's indirect, inaudible nature revelation to man has now been somewhat eclipsed by sin. We're told in Romans 1 or 2 that um, uh, people see sufficient of God in nature and yet they turn away from him and worship and bow down to images. And yet even the degree of revelation coming through from God in nature to savages is sufficient to render fallen man without excuse, although it's much less extensive since the fall than it was in the Garden of Eden. And yet, God's present revelation to man in nature can only be correctly understood when we view it through the spectacles of Holy Scripture. Therefore, Scripture is totally essential to really understand anything about anything.
if we don't put the spectacles of scripture on our nose in looking at a plant in front of us we will not understand the plant uh, to the complete possible human extent God's special revelation to man has now been reduced to writing in scripture and God's special revelation is now only found in the permanent deposit of scripture through which we must view everything else that God has created which is subject to the curse on account of sin we need to see then that our universe is now abnormal and it's abnormal because it's stained with sin first of all the unfallen creation was normal because it was sinless sin you see is a departure from God's norms unfallen man was normal he had a knowledge that was normative original revelation to Adam before the fall was normal so man could truly know through this revelation both paramount direct audible revelation in nature and subservient indirect inaudible revelation were normal as the sum total of God's original revelations to man fallen creation however is abnormal because it is stained with sin although some parts of creation today are more abnormal than others now creation is abnormal today because our present sin represents a departure from God's norms which are still normative that is to say God still expects us to live by the same standards which he set for man before the fall even though we can no longer do it unregenerate fallen man is abnormal this means that ultimately he has no knowledge unregenerate fallen man is only normative uh, to, that is to say to be followed to the extent to which common grace operates within him now common grace the grace that God gives to all men whether they're saved or lost common grace is only detectable in terms of the biblical revelation regenerate fallen man is only semi-normal if we're born again we're normal part of the time and abnormal the rest of the time and we have this tension within us and we'll continue to have it until Jesus comes back and the new earth arrives only the Bible can now make us more or less normal before the second coming so I would say the Bible semi normalizes the Christian nature revelation is now obscured and yet it is at least semi interpretable through the Bible but God's new revelation his wrath revelation uh, to man was only given after man's fall and against man's sin the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all those who in godlessness suppress or hold down the revelation of God now creation once restored restored after the second coming will be consummated taken a step further than it was before Adam sinned this is why I like to call the whole of the universe after the second coming as ultra normal beyond the normal because then there will be no stain of sin no revelation of God's wrath except perhaps in hell no Bible revelation uh, we're told that God's word will not pass away until heaven and earth pass away of course the word of God itself won't pass away even then but it's questionable whether we will have the Bible on the new earth forever as opposed to direct communication from God to us
only direct and indirect revelation will then remain. And yet, all uh, the whole of creation, the whole of the universe will have become expanded from the Garden of Eden right down to the new earth to come. We conclude by positing a few questions for further study. Uh, first of all, we would point out again that only persons can sin. However, this does not mean that only men can sin. Fallen angels too have sinned and do sin. Nor does this mean that man can sin only as an individual. For scripture also mentions that families and nations too can both believe and sin. Second, we need to see that persons, families, and nations can sin. But personalities, family structures, and nationalities cannot sin. Similarly, labor unions and governments and schools cannot sin, although they may be, and indeed are, affected by sin. Even their structures can be affected by sin, although they themselves cannot sin any more than a thorn or a thistle can sin, although obviously thorns and thistles have been affected by man's sin. Third, accordingly, institutions and even the universe as a whole can be redeemed or bought back we are inadequate if we say that Christ came merely to redeem man. Christ came to redeem, that is, to buy back the universe. And yet, we would not say that the universe can be evangelized, for only men can hear the gospel and respond. Fourth, evangelism deals only with human persons, both individually and covenantally or collectively. Redemption, however, deals with the whole of creation. Hence, labor unions, schools, and businesses, etc., do all need redeeming, but they do not need evangelizing, because only the persons in labor unions, schools, and businesses can be evangelized. But labor unions and schools and businesses and churches do need restructuring, according to the teachings of the Bible. Less importantly, they also need restructuring according to nature as interpreted by the Bible. All Christians should attempt to structurally reform labor unions, schools, businesses and churches and governments. Christians should never rest content in a lazy fair situation that is just let things remain as they are because the way things are at the moment even in society represents a sinful deformation of original structures which used to be very good when we restructure these various spheres of influence such as schools and businesses however we must see that such restructuring is subject to evangelism. For further study, we recommend the following books. First of all, Dr. Berkauer's two volumes on sin. Second, uh, my own book on the origin and destiny of man. And third, Miller's great volumes on the Christian doctrine of sin. <laughs>